at Finastra, and a uh, pleasure to be here and to co-facilitate with my wonderful man, Will. I'll take it away, Will. Hello. Hello. Hey, Chris. Thanks. Hi, everyone. My name is Will. So I'm the Design and Customer Innovation Lead in APEC, supporting Chris Doro on the same thing as well. So looking forward to, to the session today. Thank you, everyone. And uh, over to who should be next? Uh, Etienne, do you want to go next? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me today. It's pretty exciting to see um, bridges yeah. between DeFi and TradFi. Um, and so uh, a couple of words on myself. So uh, I'm the former CEO at DeFi Pulse um, and I'm now advisor there. I've been working in DeFi for a couple of years. And before that, I was working in traditional finance as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Alejandro, do you want to go next? Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you very much, Rain. Uh, thank you very much, guys, for for the invite. We're extremely excited to be here, and yeah, just um, okay, having thoughts about what is happening when when traditional finance and DeFi get together. Right, that's uh, that's an important topic, an interesting topic. So about me, I, I am the co-founder and operations lead of DeFactor. I've been in the DeFi space probably three years and have been one of the pioneers in the real world asset space, trying to bridge traditional finance into the DeFi and using liquidity and how to extract that liquidity in an efficient manner. Cool, thank you. Virat? Oh yeah, so I work next? with, sure, <laughs> I, sorry, I work with uh, Alejandro uh, at DeFactor, so he, myself and Esto started DeFactor a year or so ago, I guess, a year and a half now. And um, <clears throat> I've been in the DeFi space, well, this time around for about a year and a half, a couple of years. Uh, previously, back in about 2016, 17, I was working uh, for a fintech where we were looking to do use um, blockchain technology to disintermediate some of the banks for supply chain finance. I've been in fintech for probably about a decade now, uh, mostly in the trade finance, supply chain finance space. Cool, thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, Mural, should we get to Mural now? For sure. So I shall link or Mural link on the chat. So uh, I kindly invite you guys to you know click on the link because we will be doing doing the ideation in the Mural board. And at the same time, I will share my screen as well on the Mural board. Sorry, did you share a link? Yeah, in the chat. All right, I don't get it. Is it able to get it? I don't see it. Maybe it's because I'm a guest. I don't know. Right, let's see. Uh, it's in the chat function, so the meeting chat. Can you see the meeting chat? I think there's an icon, uh, a chat icon that you can click on and you can see the uh, conversation. Yeah, yeah. It's weird. Uh, Sharon, could you send him privately yeah, on the... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'll send, it, uh, I'll send you the link by email. Oh, thanks. Uh, anyone else having... Uh, the same issues, not able to access the chat. I think it's it might be due to the fact that I'm a guest. Um, that, that might be the reason. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I've, right. I've sent you the wrong <laughs> the wrong link. There sure, sure. uh, it's in. <laughs> Okay, I leave receiving. it for, for Shireen to yeah to send you the link. So to every the rest of you guys, can you see the the mural board already? Okay, I guess uh, no response. I think it's good. Thank you. So yeah, welcome. Uh, so the topic for the day is connecting DeFi and trade DeFi. 
Uh, I just want to go through it quickly on the agenda side. So as a start, we you know like to go through the mural tips on you know how to use the mural, which I will go through it shortly, and then we will check. Uh, to identify what is your goal or objective that you want to achieve in this session. Uh, then moving into setting the stage where, you know, we probably could, you know, put out the, the open out the, the calls and get everybody to ask the expert over here, you know, uh, what is D5 and why D5 and, you know, use some of this information to help us to ideate further. And the third piece is the concept design, where we will go through some of the problem statements. And then what we will go through is the, what are the target audience that we could, you know, position for some of this question and what is the end user trying to achieve and what is their challenges and what are the key ideas that we could, we could, we could support some of these problem statements and move to the last piece, but uh, what is the benefits to the bank as well as the end user. Any question before I begin with the moral tips? Oh, good. Is, is everyone able to get to Miro? Is it working fine with everyone? Cool. All right. Let me first jump into the moral tips. I will summon everybody into the first session, which uh, I will guide a little bit on, you know, how to use Mural. Uh, in order to add a sticky note, you just have to double click. You can, you can try it at the same time while you're going through the tips. You can also change the post-it type, but I will encourage to stick to the square. So if you, if you click on it, you could change it over here to the different type. Then if you click on Zach and zoom and you move for you click on you hold on Zach and click, you'll be able to zoom in and zoom out. Alternative, you can use the you know control plus and control minus, which is the standard way of you know zooming in and zooming out on any screen. And if you move on, if you hold on to the space button to move around, you'll be able to you know move between all the different canvas. Move around in the canvas. And then if you hold on to X, roll over the, the post-it, you're able to, to zoom in the, you know, magnify the post-it. All right, you guys can spend some time, you know, playing around and let me know if you have any question. All good, pretty straightforward, yeah? All right, cool. Okay, I'd like to invite you guys to the next session, which is the goal and objective. I'd like to spend a couple of minutes over here to you know, get everybody to input what is the goal and objective that we're trying to meet over here today. So Will, should we all uh, like give our perspective to the objective of, of the session? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Yes, so based on the, you know, the topics of connecting DeFi and TradeFi, what is your perspective of what you really like to get out from this session?
<laughs> how to make our own finastra coin. <laughs> Yeah, I see most of you guys already input. Maybe one last minute before we kind of summarize what we have over here. All right, I think we see a big, you know, group of, uh, you know, inputs and goal and objective is to really understand, you know, the DeFi solutions. That's one, I, I, I guess, yeah, we will cover some of those. I think at the very first piece of session where the expert will definitely, you know, explain a little bit that definitely want to open up the stage to ask, to, to have you to ask questions and also the expert to explain a little bit on DeFi and, you know, what, how, how does it benefit to the customers and also to the banks. And then I think we do see areas where we talk about, you know, how, you know, we could bring DeFi to the corporates and SMB. Yes, and that is something that we have we will cover in the ideation session as well. We have some problem statements over there, which are very aligned to some of the angles that you, uh, you identify over here. Understanding what Yep. Okay, with that, shall we jump into the next piece where, you know, we want to open up the stage where uh, you know, for the experts to explain a little bit about D5 and how does it benefits to the banks as well as the end, end user. Cool. Right, let's move to the part about what is D5 and why D5. Well, what would be interesting maybe, and um, as we have Etienne, Alejandro and Biraf, um, maybe we can take the opportunity if you guys can share with us a little bit of what you actually do with uh, DeFi Pulse and DeFactor, because that would be very good intro to uh, what DeFi protocols and this is our, uh, how it can be used for um, liquidity for, for SMEs and, and, and companies as well. Um, Maybe starting with you, Etienne, if you can share with us a little bit about like an intro to DeFi Pulse, what you do there yeah, sure. and some of the key um, protocols and indices that you work on. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Chirin. So uh, DeFi Pulse is, um, I, I would say, one of the first DeFi native company uh, in the world. Uh, it's been created a few years ago when DeFi wasn't even like, I mean, it, it was the early days of DeFi and we barely had like one or two protocols uh, at that time. Um, and so uh, what we're doing is, so we're well known for the creation of a concept called TVL, Total Value Locked, which is a metric um, to assess traction in DeFi protocols. So the idea is to count the amount of money that is uh, actually locked and put to work in DeFi protocols. So when you're providing liquidity to a decentralized exchanges, you are actually locking liquidity in these DEX, what we call a DEX. When you're lending money to a protocol, that money is actually stored into a smart contract on Compound or Aave Finance, that, which are like lending protocols, lending pools. And so we're counting that and, and ranking uh, protocols based on like uh, monetary traction in a sense. So that, that's the first thing that's what got us known. And we kind of told the story of DeFi uh, during the early days because we were the only place uh, where you could actually assess the product market fit of these like protocols 
when we had less than one billion dollars locked into DeFi, and now we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of, of billion dollars locked in DeFi protocols as we speak today. So uh, the growth has been insane, uh, insane since the, the early days. And so we, we're well known for that, uh, but we're doing a, a ton of different things at DeFi Pulse. And, and one thing that uh, got us like growing a ton during the past uh, year uh, is the DeFi, is, uh, the DeFi uh, native indices business. And so what we're doing is that uh, think about like the S&P 500 or the CAC 40 in France. Uh, so we are actually replicating that these indices or basket of assets. We're designing indices, but DeFi native indices or Web3 native indices, and we're licensing these indices uh, to protocols and decentralized autonomous organizations known as DAOs to actually implement these indices. Uh, in exchange for a fee. And so uh, we're well known for a couple of indices, especially the flagship product, the DeFi Pulse Index, which is a basket of uh, assets, Web3 assets, uh, that are like heavily uh, curated by the DeFi Pulse uh, team because we are in the space for years now. So we pretty, I mean, we have a pretty extensive knowledge uh, in the space. We know what are the good projects and the bad projects. And so we kind of curate the space uh, through the inclusion or not of these assets into our indices. Um, and so we've got like D for the DeFi Pulse Index, the DPI, uh, we've got flexible leverage indices. We created a couple of weeks ago a new index, the NFTI, which is made of fractionalized NFTs into a single basket of assets. So it's, it's pretty cool and we kind of play with the composability of DeFi to create um, uh, compelling products for uh, and, and indices for end users. So that's pretty much what we're doing. Cool, thanks a lot. Um, Will, uh, I was thinking maybe we can share screen with um, DeFi Pulse website because that, that's where we would get like the, the leaderboard and uh, maybe people mm -hmm. can also look into that and, and ask any question. I have it open or if you'd like to open that I, as you prefer. Ah, sure. Please go ahead and share. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, so just give me a second. Because, yeah, I think it's, uh, you've gone through lots of things, um, <laughs> Etienne. Yeah, DeFi uh, is kind of I'm just fun. wondering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Tons of things to discuss. And uh, just wondering if people actually, how, how people in the call are familiar with these, um, with all of uh, these information. So let me share my screen. Uh, so we are looking at the DeFi Pulse um, website, uh, and this is the role of value log that you were mentioning earlier. So uh, sort of uh, analyzing the, the key DeFi protocols, right, and um, in order to understand how much liquidity is locked within each of these. Yeah, exactly. So you, you've got the total value locked uh, top chart uh, that we're seeing right now which is just tracking Ethereum mainly uh, today, but it's going to expand in the coming months to all the other chains. And so if we just like move a little bit down on the page, uh, we'll be able to see the list of protocols ranked by TDL. And so this is like a good place to start uh, in DeFi if you want to uh, get into the weeds of the protocols and, and discover MakerDAO, Curve, Convex, I mean, all these protocols that you can use on a daily basis just with an internet connection. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah, no, thank you. And uh, yeah, for uh, for people getting into the space, I think this is very interesting because you see what chain this is on and then uh, what mm -hmm. the focus of the protocol, if it's a DEX or decentralized exchange or lending, etc. And um, Etienne, do you have any, any preferred protocols that maybe you'd like to deep dive a little bit on and uh, share with us what, what they are doing? I mean, uh, I, I can start with the first one. I, I love a ton of protocols. <laughs> there are lots of exciting things in DeFi, uh, but we can start with the biggest one, Maker, uh, which is in front of us. So MakerDAO is uh, one of the first, if not the first, if I remember, uh, DeFi protocol. And so what they're doing is pretty exciting, um, especially if you're thinking about it through the prism of a bank. Um, so they, it's a, it's a smart contract. It's a set of smart contract that allows you to uh, put your ETH, so the native uh, Ethereum assets, uh, to work. By locking ETH into the smart contract, you can mint or borrow uh, a new stablecoin called DAI, D-A-I, 
And this stablecoin is created out of thin air, in a sense, even though it's backed by the collateral that you deposited, the ETH, okay? And so the protocol is, is issuing a, collater, um, a stable coin that you can use then in the DeFi space, that you can lend, that, uh, that you can trade for something else. So it's like purely algorithmic, um, and it's creating a new asset based on price speeds and collateralized um, um, ratios. So pretty interesting stuff, and one of the first DeFi uh, protocol. Uh, we can talk about Avi, uh, which is a lending protocol. Um, and so it's kind of the same as Maker, but instead of minting, um, um, so you, you're, deposit, you're lending assets, so you can deposit uh, USDC, the USD stablecoin, or ETH, or whatever, and, and borrow uh, with that collateral um, up to 80%, usually 85% of the m amount of collateral that you deposit um, in, in the protocol. Uh, and so you can land and borrow, which is pretty interesting in, in finance, right? Um, and it's completely decentralized again, so nobody can actually seize the fund. Uniswap, uh, it's the number five. Uh, it's the most, uh, it's the first DEX decentralized exchange. And so in short, it allows you to swap any asset with any other asset without any central party being involved. And so uh, you can just like take your ETH and trade it for USD, uh, USDC and take your USDC and trade it for ETH. And so there are like thousands of different uh, assets available on Uniswap and all the, 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 the copycats of Uniswap, I would say. Um, and so, yeah, they, they're doing a great job in the DeFi space. Um, and so you can trade, but you can also be the liquidity provider. You can be the bank in DeFi, which is pretty interesting. So uh, by being a liquidity provider, you can take your ETH, take your USDC, and, and provide liquidity to the protocol so that people can actually trade against it. And so that's what really interesting to me in DeFi is that anyone can become the bank in a sense. Um, and so, yeah, Uniswap is doing a great job on that uh, specific front. And then, I mean, we could, um, we could spend yeah. hours on that, so we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna show I love that. the, everyone can be, can be the bank with uh, decentralized finance. And, um, just wanted to mention to everyone in the call, if you have questions, you can unmute and ask your questions. I think that the purpose really of the session is to be interactive. So feel free to post your questions and uh, we'll be all happy to, to take them. Um, that's really interesting. Thanks a lot for sharing. Uh, one more question for you, Etienne, uh, before uh, we move on maybe to Alejandro and Berov. Um, for uh, newbies in the space, um, what's your advice on, on how to get started? Oh, <laughs> uh, read a lot. It's the space is, is I mean, it's like finance, uh, but, but, but finance usually is behind gatekeepers. So you can't do like all the things you could do with DeFi. So take a lot of time studying protocols before uh, doing anything with them because there, there is no gatekeeper. Um, and so check there. Uh, read a lot, uh, spend time studying protocols, asking questions, um, and then, I mean, it's going to just, one, one day you, you're going to find out that it's it's awesome. Uh, but take the time to study before um, putting money to work there. And do you think the banks should be the gatekeepers here? Uh, it, it's it's a complicated question. <laughs> we, can, we can spend hours on that. I like the idea of um, uh, allowing anyone to to be their own bank and, and do what they want with their money. Obviously, we need to protect people in some way. Um, I think banks could play a role, definitely. Um, actors like DeFi Pulse are actually doing that already by creating indices and assets in their indices. So you, you everybody can be a, a, a finance geek or nerd, right? There are people that don't like that and they don't want to spend time studying that. So in that case, rely on banks or actors like disciples to actually uh, help you and guide you. Oh, Just you. probably one question cool. on that, right? You said that uh, anyone can be in and there are no gatekeepers and that's kind of counter to banks being regulated, right? So for for anybody to invest, uh, you know, what's what's the risk and what kind of returns are currently available on these protocols? Mm, on the regulatory side of things, I agree it's not yet regulated, not ideally regulated. And uh, this is something that 
discussing in a way because if we are i mean like usually people tend to say that it's not real <laughs> you know DeFi and crypto it's not real because it's not yet regulated so we can't really use bitcoin we can't really use ethereum on a daily basis to save money and earn interest uh, the day we will be able to do it it's going to be a big bang and so and it will be regulated so i'm expect i'm, I'm actually waiting for that <laughs> uh, i'm pretty excited about regulation uh, in a sense um, and regarding returns, I mean, uh, you can get uh, on like the more the safest protocol side compound and Aave on the lending side, you can get, I don't know, like depending on market situations, 3% uh, to 10% APYs on your deposits. Uh, and if you're looking at more uh, uh, dangerous protocols, uh, newest protocols, I mean, uh, the sky is the limit, <laughs> but um, I wouldn't advise that. <laughs> at least to begin with. Thanks. So we um, I'll be sharing my screen again uh, really quick to show the DeFi Pulse index because it's it's we interesting to look at all of the um, all of the different protocols that are listed on the leaderboard. It's also uh, interesting to take a look at the indices that uh, that are now available on top of that. Do you want maybe uh, to say a couple of words about this, Etienne? Oh yeah, sure. So um, you, you're looking right now at the website Token Sets, which is uh, a protocol. Uh, OK, and so what we're doing is that we, DeFi Pulse, are licensing the index, the design of the index and the brand to Token Set and the DAO behind it called the Index Co-op. And so what they're doing is they are actually operating the index. The index. Uh, we're not. We're just licensing the brand and the, and the, the IP. And so what you're seeing right now is the actual implementation of our index into an, a, a, an ERC20 token called the DPI. And so you can look at the price chart and before uh, and below, sorry, uh, you can see the Uniswap, Aave, and if you click on see more, um, you're going to see the composition of the uh, index. Okay, so the, the basket of assets included into the uh, index. And so what we're doing at DeFi Bells, uh, we're actually every month, at the end of every month, we're looking at this like basket of assets and we are rebalancing the index um, according to rules that are pretty close to the ones that you will find in, in traditional finance, you know, like uh, taking into account market cap uh, to weight the assets uh, into the index. And so what we're doing is that we're rebalancing the assets. You can just like get exposure to the index and just sit back and relax. We are creating the market for you in a sense and just like and picking the, the blue chips of the DeFi space. So we're doing that for the DeFi space. We're doing that for the NFT space and we're going to do that for many more uh, subsectors of the Web3 ecosystem in, in the coming months. So yeah. Cool. Thank you. So for people that are interested in uh... In DeFi, not sure where to put their first um, investments in instead of going maybe just for um, one of these protocols, they can go with the full index, which is uh, which given them exposure to the major uh, DeFi protocols. And this um, is not a financial advice. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And uh, no, that's, that's definitely interesting. Hey, Shireen, just to jump in here, there's a question coming in on the chat is that uh, what is the programming language we use for the DeFi hackathon? Uh, yeah, good question. There is no uh, uh, constraints or obligation to use any specific language or any specific blockchain. You can go with whatever you're really uh, keen to explore here. It's completely open. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Etienne before we move to uh, Birav and Alejandro? Uh, Will, is this, uh, is this covering what you had in mind for um, the um, intro to, uh, like, what is DeFi, why DeFi, from a mirror yeah. world perspective? Yeah. I think cool. from a goal and objective is that we really want to set the stage that, you know, get everybody to understand DeFi and, you know, the why DeFi. I think, the, yeah, definitely cover that. Oh, uh, I see we've got a question from uh, Ian. Hey, Shireen. Hi, guys. Okay. So just a quick question, because I'm um, the concept of DeFi kind of evolved, right? Before, centralized 
um, like entities such as Binance yes. or or um, well uh, uh, other entities like uh, which they they have your private key, right? We call them before DeFi, but now um, has that definition evolved? Because I looked at the the list of uh, the in, in the DeFi in uh, um, the DeFi pulse indices, and most of them are really decentralized, meaning to say non-custodial, right? So just a question in terms of the definition of DeFi. Uh, Etienne, do you want to take Yeah, I, I can yeah. touch on that. Uh, thanks for the question. So, um, like, just to make it simple, I think there are three main uh, categories of um, applications, in a sense. Um, there are, like, CFI, centralized finance, okay? Like Coinbase and, and, and Binance which uh, you, you do not own the keys of the wallet, so you do not, it's not your coins, okay? So if the actions gets axed, ex gets act, sorry, um, you, you're gonna lose the money. You're not really in charge. So that's called CFI. It's pretty close to, um, to a traditional finance um, uh, actor. Then uh, we've got DeFi, which is on the other side of the spectrum, which is a place where you can just access with um, a wallet, so you need to own the funds yourself and, and, and custody, do some self-custody on top. And so these are the protocols that we are covering in, in the DeFi Pulse Index. And then there's a new category, which is pretty interesting to me. And I think that's where we are going to, that's what we're going to talk about today is the CDFI trend. Okay, so it's centralized finance plugged on top of decentralized finance. And so the idea is to let anyone use DeFi protocols, but with a uh, good UX layer on top, okay? So you don't have to uh, take care of the keys. You don't have to take care about the transactions on MetaMask. I don't know if you're using that, but it's, it's an, I mean, it's great from a UX point of view, but mm -hmm. uh, not that easy to, to, get, uh, to get into at, the, at first sight. Um, and so, yeah, CDFI is pretty interesting. And we're seeing the first um, uh, glimpse uh, of that in, in, in some centralized uh, solutions like Coinbase, where you can actually use like compound finance, but mm -hmm. on Coinbase. And that's, that's huge. So DeFi protocols being used by centralized entities. Oh, thank okay. you. Alejandro and, and, and Vera, don't, uh, don't hesitate if you have anything to add on that. <laughs> Yeah, look, I, I think I think it's important just to mention that that the DeFi component is is just that technology that is allowing you to decentralize the, the use of finance as as we know it, right? But but that technology can be applied to absolutely everything. And and as a team was mentioning, like you're starting seeing all these centralized entities taking that technology and starting to apply it into their own services, right? which is which is interesting for for the people that don't want to dive head first and spend months investigating what is happening in the space right because the space is evolving all the time and it's tricky sometimes so uh, i think that's a that's a good evolution thank you um any other questions uh if no maybe we uh we should continue with you alejandro and uh, thereof um on what you are doing with a uh, factor if you can share with us a little bit more there yeah so i i, I will give you the journey and, and probably this will be a better um a better story for everybody in, in the in the in the call so we started um in the DeFi space probably three years ago and we had a, a concept of providing trade finance services and uh, inventory finance services to, to um, companies yeah. that were involved in the commercial, in, in the international commerce and, and logistics and trade and, and, and trade finance space. Uh, but the difference was that we want to just collateralize the assets that are getting transported, right? And uh, digitize those assets in order to just make the information flow, the physical flow, and the and the financial flow a bit, a bit more efficient, right? And we're just doing the proof of concept. We went to a lot of traditional um, traditional uh, sources of liquidity, and we couldn't find a single one that were backing us up, right? And we met the guys from MakerDAO, 
in Vienna and they liked the concept that we had. And they say, look guys, we want to do a pilot. I said, well, fantastic. That's what MakerDAO was at that time. I think there was the only <laughs> DeFi uh, protocol and they were just starting to explore and understand how real world assets were a, or could be linked right into the DeFi space. And, and this is really important, right? Because from the DeFi space, I think real world assets can bring to a, a big, um, sorry, are you guys hearing, like, I can hear some feedback. Are you guys hearing that as well, or is it just me? Yeah. Um, you fine. If we hear you fine, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, at, so I was mentioning that uh, real world assets uh, can bring two extremely positive components to the DeFi. One, that is a stability, because real world assets are more stable than digital assets. And that's something that or, that was uh, one of the main reasons why MakerDAO started to explore into real world assets. I don't know if you remember there was an episode when uh, Maker had um, a lot of assets that were not uh, covered by the collaterals. So there was a huge uh, wipe in, in the whole system that caused a lot of losses. And then they're starting to explore, okay, if we can put some of our own assets linked into the real world, we're going to be just kind of navigating a little bit better all the uh, stability that is required in the space. And the second one is, uh, is about uh, volume, right? Because even though the space has grown dramatically, in the last three years, and we are around 200 uh, billion in assets block, that's not big enough if we want to put DeFi to compete to traditional finance in a way, or seeing as an alternative source of liquidity, right? So from that uh, from, from that journey that we have with the guys from Maker and the guys from Centrifuge trying to, to bring real world assets into the DeFi space, we realized that there is a huge opportunity and uh, a lot of people are, are in, in, in big need for liquidity, right? But the problem is that the space is immature and is not ready yet. So you are trying to bring traditional companies to plug into the DeFi space. They will do it once, twice, and they say, yeah, this is a great opportunity, but call me when it's ready because it's not now. It's extremely manual still. It's a bit clunky. Uh, financial institutions, financial companies should, or, or they, they will need to change dramatically all these uh, complex financial processes that they have behind in order to be transacting, right? And what we want in the factor is provide the same experience, right, as these institutions have when they are tapping into traditional funds and just make the DeFi space a, a, a true competitor when we're talking about the potential of, of, of providing that liquidity just to, to provide traditional financial services, or for your mortgage, for all these different uh, financial uh, alternatives out there, right? And it's important to, to mention, right, that there are a lot of illiquid assets at the moment that have great value and they are not covered by traditional finance. And that's one of the things that DeFi can clearly tap on, right? Have examples as, for example, whiskey, uh, art, um, what else is out there? Luxury goods, right? All these things are, they have extreme value, right? But it's com they're completely illiquid. So if you're starting thinking about how tokenizing those those real world assets and bringing it into the FI space to just unlock liquidity, you're starting seeing a really powerful picture right there. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Alejandro, you mentioned something interesting earlier, like the, um, uh, the fact that it's perceived as not mature yet, what makes this perception? So I think I think it's really important to maybe explore that a bit further. That's what the uh, hackathon participants would would be working on. So if you can maybe um, elaborate a little bit on that, what are the pain points today? Oh, there there are many. Uh, <laughs> for example, the the digitization of assets still still. Be bit be complex and, and can be sometimes clunky on ramp and off ramp of fiat uh, and crypto that's that's another component that that can be tricky uh, you will have some um issues as well when 
you are starting just bringing digital assets into an accounting for a normal company and how you're going to be tracking all the fees that are in on chain of chain. So you need to be able to just gather all that information. Then when you are going on the investor side, right? Because that's, that's an important one of the things that, that I think explained really well is the fact that DeFi is allowing democratization of, of investment. And I think for me, that's one of the key components in the DeFi space that if I, if I believe in a project and I want to back that project, I can just put $1,000 or I can put 500, I can put 5,000 crypto or I can put some amount behind because I believe in the project and I don't need anyone in the middle to be telling me that I can't or I cannot. I think that's extremely powerful. But the problem that you have with that is that the visibility sometimes is not enough for investors to take decisions. And I think something that needs to be improved, right? In the real world asset space, like uh, these uh, companies that are providing financial services, they are digitizing assets and they're putting those assets to, through, through the, the DeFi protocols to obtain liquidity. But sometimes, we don't have enough information on what those assets are. And I think it's important just to know, right? To just to cover your risk, to understand if you actually are comfortable or not placing funds into these liquidity pools. So I think that visibility component is extremely important and needs to be improved. Uh, and according to that as well, reporting, I don't think we are doing a great job still from the reporting side in the DeFi space. We need to improve that. And that's some, that's some of the things that probably <laughs> We can learn from the traditional finance space, right? I think that um, th there there are the lessons that both sides should learn, and and um, that will kind of uh, improve whatever uh, is being done in both spaces. Shereen, you are you are in mute. Shereen, we have some question coming in from Mahef mm -hmm. as well. Uh, how are taxes applied in the DeFi space and which jurisdiction government D accepts? These are two questions that- <laughs> Very you know, easy question for you, Alejandro. <laughs> wow. I should, I should tell you this, pass this to, to Vaira. <laughs> no, look, th there are a lot of debates, right? And I think it depends on, on your jurisdiction and how you are, the uh, uh, structure, right? Like. There are a lot of great areas there that uh, at the moment not even agencies or tax agencies can 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 uh, answer to we're seeing at least we're, we're based in europe and we're seeing in europe the european union is starting to just have some or providing some guidelines right on, on how these assets are going to be taxed uh, and what you can do with the assets but i think it's still it's still a great area i don't know like at the end i don't know if you have any comment towards that and a lot of saying like is the, you know. yeah so i think it, you, you've got to separate it out into two different things right so you've got to think about your um let's say your crypto holdings and how do you deal with taxation on your own holdings right so within uh, a country they'll have some guidance so the uk has guidance ireland has guidance on how how you deal with um uh with your crypto earnings so changes in pricing and also i think in the uk recently they have just uh, put an opinion out on what staking means and how do you tax staking is staking something that's taxable event once stakes once you claim or as you actually receive the the reward so those are things that you need to to take a look at really individually in your own in your own jurisdiction and obviously india's changing that as well when you're looking at uh, let's say traditional finance and, and DeFi, you know what we're you still have a traditional structure in the background, right? You're still using SPVs. You're still using um, traditional structures because you need to have that on and off ramp in uh, from crypto into to, to actual companies' bank accounts. Uh, and then that's really a, a matter on where you, uh, how you're structuring and where your tax obligations lie based on that financing. So for example, if you're looking at things that we're doing when it comes to invoices we're dealing with true sales of invoices right and that true sale is between two different entities and it's a question of which is that entity that's buying it and what the, what's the governing law of that agreement so um in that sense you can be a little bit more flexible in the way that you uh, you structure that because of course depending on what jurisdictions you want to be in uh, you can then pay taxes in those jurisdictions right Right, but in terms of the uh, anonymity or pseudonym, pseudonymous kind of transactions that flow in in the uh, DeFi space, right? Uh, wouldn't that be fungible? 
as in you could almost uh, be an investor from a jurisdiction that you would want to be. Uh, yes, but I guess the the question really is like, so you're you're still putting money into the system, right? So there'll be someone, some, and you'll be yeah, still so be asked on the question of what yes, assets you own. On ramp, off ramp, yeah. So that will be the endpoints yeah. where you will get. So definitely. at the moment, so, with w within the ecosystem, and again, Etienne maybe maybe knows more, but there is no real taxation as such. What that means, I guess, in terms of gas fees, could be the the key taxation there in in some respect. But I mean, that's um, but. But no, I mean, there's obviously nothing going on around that. It literally is where you're holding your money and where you're putting it. And obviously you're exchanging it somewhere. That transaction is visible. I mean, that's the thing about the blockchain, right? You yeah. People can see which transactions are going on. And if you're going into a centralized exchange, that's tied to your KYC. And that's where you, you're bringing the bridge between DeFi and CFI as in even the traditional banking uh, ecosystem. Yeah, so there is still that need for on and off ramp. So companies like Circle, um, you know, providing that USDC on and off ramp into bank accounts, right? It's a it's a good example. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch and bunch of other uh, other businesses doing that. And a lot of banks currently now are uh, are also dealing with crypto on and off ramps. Um, look, I I think what's really interesting for the space to under like to realize how deeply uh, some tax agencies around the world know the crypto space. And that's, uh, I don't know, you saw the case of the Bitcoin that were recovered not long ago that were lost for X amount of years, right? Meaning that there is a full traceability over there. And uh, if the government at some point just start pushing the engine to see who has and who is holding crypto and who actually is exchanging that crypto from uh, to fiat work, just triggers taxation to events they can do it right i got in the early days yeah it was really easy to for you to just buy a, a, a or buy crypto directly from someone like that's how a lot of people did in the beginnings but but that is almost over nowadays and you will always almost of the times you will go through a through a centralized exchange that is tied to your credentials your kyc and so on meaning that there's, there's a trace there, right? So, um, a lot and of, of course you can, yeah, you can go darker. So you can go into some of the darker places on the web, but then your risk of loss is higher, right? Yeah. But I think that just probably for a later conversation. But in terms of you know the attractiveness of DeFi was you know the lack of any governance and freedom for anybody to get into a structure or in, into participating into finance but when you when but, you're replicating almost the real world again so what's the attractiveness apart from traceability of smart contracts from a tech standpoint so there's still so i think that i guess what, what you're missing there is that so let's take for example so you know back in 2012 when i got into fintech right we were working globally providing supply chain finance trade finance to businesses what you found in let's say 2014 15 when when the basel 2 came out banks started to stop reducing the lending, right? Because they started pulling out of, of areas like, so we were active in South America, Citibank just decided to leave, right? So the amount of funding that is required for businesses in that in that area is beyond the current, the, the local banking's uh, <clears throat> ability, right? So what you can do is obviously what we're doing and what we're looking to do is say, okay, there are businesses that need financing in, in Chile, Mexico, wherever it is, who have got solid, uh, you know, risk reputation, risk scores, solid trading, we can bring those products and we can create the, um, the ability to invest in those businesses through our DeFi you know, lending pools to people, democratize that essentially, allow other, you know, allow the, the, the any person to, to come up and put some money in. So if you look at what Centrifuge is doing with their liquidity pools, you can go and pick a company you like um, and put some cash into it. And those are products you wouldn't, you wouldn't find on the high street, right? You know, bank is not going to offer that to you. And I think that's the key. So it, it's more along the lines of allowing the average citizen to invest in, just, in deals that they wouldn't be able to see. Okay. Thanks. And I think at the, at the same at the same at the same time, right? Like you have traditional, uh, sorry, alternative financial companies that can tap into into that type of liquidity pools to create new financial services that at the moment that at the moment are not covered by the traditional space, right? Plus, I think if you look at the way that you can, so one of the 
the proof of concepts we did with Alejandro and um, one of his companies, Console Freight, was to to tie not just uh, DeFi but also you know insurance, so you can track shipments going across the world. Um, you've got IoT uh, sensors on the containers. Once, uh, let's say, for example, as a refrigeration. For, you know, refrigerated bananas if the temperature hits below a certain level you can do use parametric insurance to then immediately get insurance payments out right so you're, you're looking beyond just me moving money around you're actually taking you know you're looking at how can we more effectively create an ecosystem where cash has moved much much more quicker more and i think yeah. more efficiently and i think if you look at what Maersk and ibm are doing and all those kinds of things you know what marco polo is looking at is to say okay as soon as i've got a bill of lading as soon as the, the goods come on board i can start triggering the first set of payments and you know that's that's where we can make you know you can that's where you can really help businesses to provide them liquidity much earlier than you would do normally in the traditional finance system because you're doing lots of checks and balances so probably as an idea from a hackathon standpoint do you look at this also getting embedded now into into those platforms especially when you're looking at you know uh, bill of lading or ports or where you're actually doing the uh, transfer of goods, transfer of deeds or, or any element. So that's where you could embed your platform yeah. into. Definitely. And that's these are these are things that we're we're working on in de facto. But I think even beyond that, right, you you as Alejandro says, what we're seeing now is we're seeing companies that are born with DeFi first as a business model, right? Not traditional finance first. And that gives them a very different outlook on how they how they how they deal with everything actually how they deal with investors how they deal with uh, businesses so I think that's it's it's kind of it's a shift in thinking that needs to happen really so that, that that's 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 very interesting right because at the moment when you are going to traditional sources of liquidity right they they demand some sort of covenants that you need to comply with and you are out of those covenants especially from the risk assessment point of view there is no money for you right DeFi provides a different flexibility in that sense, right? Because you can negotiate your corners directly with the investors that have a little bit uh, of, of the way that they see risk is completely different. And that allows you to create this type of new services that are coming. I got, you, can, you can start thinking about what is going to happen in five, 10 years, right? When, when uh, the metaverse is coming full flow and there are a lot of companies that are providing services directly in the metaverse and what is going to happen with those guys when they go to a bank asking for a loan because they want to increase the number of people they want to increase the capital that are put into the metaverse try to imagine how how funny that conversation is going to be huh? <laughs> but the people that identify the space they understand what is happening right and they will have different ways to reach to mitigate the risk of putting actually that liquidity into these new services that are going to be created. There are solid digital, but but there is a physical component in there, right? Yeah, sounds like lots of uh, hackathon ideas here. <laughs> um, Alejandro and Biraf, I was thinking maybe uh, just if we can go quickly. I, I was on your on the um, on the defactor.com website, and uh, you have um. Uh, let me share my screen. I don't know if you want maybe to walk us through what we have there as an example of what we you are doing in the space. It would be easier for everyone really to to understand. Uh, do you see my screen? Yes, we can. Cool. So. Um, do you want maybe to take us through that? So de facto connecting liquidity providers, asset originator, and then I, I was thinking about this um, chart. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't I mean, know if you, do you want me to start from the bottom? <laughs> sure. I mean, at a very high level, right? So what we have is we have asset originators that come to us that require funding. Uh, they'll be put. They'll go through a registration process, so a KYC AML process. Uh, Alejandro's team does the due diligence on um, their you know, risk mitigation framework, uh, the risk assessment framework. And once they've passed through that uh, KYC AML process, we then, um, from a blockchain perspective, what we do is we register them on our, uh, on our KYC register. They then uh, need to stake tokens, so they need to stake factor tokens in order to access the funding. So then we uh, open up a funding portal to them where they can upload their assets. So either it's uh, via APIs we, that we have that they can send us 
you know, invoices and uh, sorry, uh, assets in volume, or if it's um, a smaller business that has fewer assets, they can go through the portal and and actually uh, upload that their information. Once that information is there, um, at a point in time, a little bit before that, we'll have worked with various liquidity providers to understand which liquidity pools that they will be working with. So we work with a number of different liquidity providers. Uh, and once they request funding, what we do is we we check, as Alejandro says, that you've got covenants. So we check the various covenants that are there for that pool to ensure that pool, um, we don't break any of them. So that gives that, that gives the, um, uh, the reassurance to the investors that we're not, you know, the risk framework that the pool is in place, uh, has in place is, is being met. Uh, we create NFTs for that, uh, for those assets, and those NFTs then get locked in a wallet, and that wallet then, uh, then that uh, those asset originators are sent the crypto to wallet, which we it gets converted into into fiat into their uh, into their um, into their bank accounts. So that's kind of that at a very high level. There's obviously a lot of stuff that happens underneath, but yeah. So lots of uh, quite complex processes leading into uh, transforming some of these real world assets into NFTs and then using making these NFTs available to investors. <laughs> Pretty high level. Yeah. So then essentially those they're, they're made available to so they're locked into into actual liquidity pools and uh, mm -hmm. investors will invest in those liquidity pools okay. themselves and essentially because they're not they're not buying individual uh, NFTs at this uh, assets at this point in time it's a pool of assets that they'll be putting money into. Oh, thank you. Um, do we have any, any questions? Uh, any additional questions to um, Virav and Alejandro before moving back into mural and ideation? Let's get back to Hey guys, good morning. Um, oh. I, it's uh, okay. Harold uh, Mitchell. Uh, how you guys doing? Good to see you again. I was going to ask if you guys could um, expand on uh, the opportunity you guys have with Algorand and what's going on with you guys going forward, forward with the grant that you received um, and the ASAs. Um, if you could just whatever information you can share. Uh, I'd love to, love to hear what you guys are working on with them. Hi, Harold. How are you? Um, so yes, what we're doing, like, what we're doing there is we're doing a kind of a stripped down end-to-end uh, -end process of de facto there. So we, we're um, but using the ASAs to, to create real world asset NFTs. Um, and for the first delivery, we're actually creating our, our own liquidity pools in, on Algorand and then essentially that same process, right? So asset originators will create assets. They'll be locked into our own liquidity pools and we'll be transferring money directly back to those um, those asset originators. So the first kind of iteration is a proof of concept that we're working specifically on using invoices as, as, uh, as the base, because we've got, obviously that's one of the, the key things that we've got at the moment. And the idea there is to use the grant to, to, to essentially test out Algorand as a blockchain as to you know how efficient is it how well you know what kind of transactions can what, what transaction volume can we really put through can we do a lot of what we want to do further down the line with the asas so if we're looking at things like secondary markets etc so we're, we're basically just using that grant to as a as essentially a proof of concept for us to be able to build liquidity pools um uh, the nft structure the some of the risk management piece all of that on on algorand so essentially a duplication of what we're doing at the moment. Excellent. Uh, it sounds like you just guys are expanding the network to other uh, blockchain platforms to give yourself more exposure uh, in addition yes, to so that, Ether and Binance and now Algorand and just kind of seed the earth with uh, the de facto product. Yes, because one of the complexities, well, one of the interesting complexities we have is that obviously the liquidity pools that we work with are on different chains. Um, and not even on different EVMs. And so we need to create that structure and be very certain of how we're how we're dealing with that. So this kind of this gives us a little bit of room to experiment with that grant on. There are different ways for us to be able to obtain liquidity and maintain collateral, et cetera, uh, on those chains. And so we just we're using it to kind of figure out what's the best way of, for us to do that. Excellent. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. LFG.
Thank you. Any other questions? Cool, then, uh, Will, do you want to share your screen again? And uh, we go back to Mural. Right, right. Thank you, Shireen. Good conversation there. I think, you know, we kind of cover what if, uh, what is DeFi and why right. DeFi. Right. So I think okay. now is a good time to tackle the four problem statements that we identify for the session. Uh, as I mentioned in the concept design, there are a few pillars that we, you know, we'd like to cover. Number one, we have the problem statements. The next is that you know, we want to identify who are the target audience and what is the target audience like to achieve and what their challenges they are facing trying to achieve that is the job to be done. And then we move on into idea, you know, what is the ideas that we could tackle for the problem statement for the uh, selected customers. And with that, what is the benefit to the bank? For that, I would like to start off with the very first one. Let me summarize everyone over here. The first problem statement is that how can banks offer DeFi investment solution to their client? So in the first piece, uh, I would like to get everybody to you know think about who are the target audience that we can tackle for these problem statements. Who are the target audience that the bank can you know providing DeFi investment solutions to? Feel free to input your you know post it over here, or you can just talk it out and we can type it. So for anybody who's not actually in the mural. Uh, feel free to just share on here and, and we can capture it as well. So who who traditionally, who is the target customer? And and again, this goes to DeFactor and, and DeFi Pulse. Like if a bank is offering DeFi investments, what who do you see as the their target customers or their target market that they're currently going after today? Mm, in short, I would say like, all the people in the world that are willing to invest their money uh, into something, but they don't want to uh, delve into DeFi. They're not DeFi native people. Um, and so they want to rely on a centralized party they, they trust to, to be the relay and, and the bridge to the DeFi space. And so. Yeah, I think what you're seeing now is mostly targeted to retail, right? Retail? Retail investors. Retail investors. And uh, tell me a little bit more about those retail investors. Like, uh, <clears throat> are they trying to, I guess, uh, balance out asset classes? Or are they, are they hardcore into digital? Are they... Um, are they younger generations? Are they looking to, I don't know, expand into the metaverse? Are they? Uh, yeah, I so, would say uh, from... yeah, go, go ahead. No, no, so from no, what no, I'm, I'm seeing, it's, 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 ba it's basically banks trying to reach out and, uh, to those who are kind of crypto curious, but don't necessarily have the time or the knowledge to invest in, in actually all the research that needs to be done. Okay, I like it. Yeah, as an investor myself, I think for one of the objectives I have to make is really to diversify my portfolio. So some of this in uh, in stock, then you want to try some part in in cryptocurrency as well. You know, high risk, high return uh, portion of it. Uh, should it be a, as well like people who've never heard about crypto <laughs> so as a way to introducing those people to to what's happening on the crypto world and how to invest in the space yeah maybe not the first the early adopters of this but <laughs> i say crypto naive is that fair to say <laughs> Um, okay, so if we have these tar like let's say we're looking at these tar 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 three target cars of customers. Oh, jeez, let's try that again. Uh, let's move it into the next column. So the people interested in DeFi but not quite the trust yet. If these people, what are they actually trying to achieve? 
by investing in DeFi? I would say, we already said it, that uh, portfolio diversifications, um, having access to a new asset class, yeah. uh, betting on the new internet, you know, Web 3.0. I think yield as well, right? Especially now that uh, a lot of the interest rates are low. Oh, yeah. Um, so I can say better margins compared to traditional markets. Margin return. The thrill investing in crypto. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but uh, my heart gets pumping every day uh, a lot more with crypto investing than it does with all the traditional stuff, especially lately. Um, Okay, so what about uh, the, the naive people that are crypto naive or that don't really understand crypto? What are they trying to achieve? They just are they do they have FOMO? Is that it? Yeah, that could be one. Could be one. FOMO, fear of missing out for anybody that. Uh, Um, okay, and then so then moving across again. So, what challenges do you think? So, I'm uh, I'm an original investor. I'm want to go to my bank. <coughs> I want to invest in DeFi. Um, what barriers? What 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 things am I hitting? What, what walls am I hitting right now? Yeah, I guess that's everything Alejandro was mentioning earlier. Like. Uh user experience, clunky processes, uh, the on-ramping or fronting. I'll try to <laughs> add some post-its there. Regulations. Yeah, regulations. Self-custody. Of course, it is a big one, yeah. yeah. What is it? Sorry, I missed that one minute. Self-custody. Self and also security, really. So security is the other issue, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of rug pulls, hacking. Yeah, on ramping off on okay. I also think like the volatility is the other issue, right? Uh, true. Yeah. Mm. Maybe also the, um, what you mentioned earlier, the lack of uh, visibility about the, the assets people are investing in, so. You know, you know, one that is interesting that, that, that people don't talk much, but it's, it's, it's funny because the knowledge of crypto, right, is really dispersed. And in order for you to understand what is good knowledge that is online to what is not, it takes time to identify. So there is, there's not that, that source that you go and you grab everything. It, it doesn't really exist, yeah. right? Sorry. Yeah, exactly. That's what Etienne was mentioning earlier, like uh, the advice for newbies. Read a lot, ask lots of questions. Maybe something yeah. uh, that banks or traditional players can help with. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and that would apply directly to especially the people who are crypto naive and they're coming in and they're saying, okay, well, I want to do some research. And then all of a sudden you're just like, well, one website said this and then another place says this and then my friend said this and then you're just like, okay, well, ah, screw it. Okay. And, and all of these sites would say, this is not financial advice. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, back to the uh, do your own research, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so for if now if we use kind of the 
you know, you have a fear of missing out. Um, if you use some of those trying to main goals or objectives, and then how would we overcome these, some of these barriers or what, what would really wow our end users if we could provide them with something? And if we go to anybody on the call, do you, do you have any ideas on how would you, how would you circumvent or any of these barriers here? Um, or enhance user Sorry, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, please. Oh, I mean, I mean, like um, custody services, like like centralized exchanges do, uh, Coinbase and, and Binance. So okay. the idea of not having to take care of your own keys, at least to begin with, to get up to speed. And then when you are comfortable enough with your knowledge and, and in the space and, and capabilities to own your keys and your coins, move on to the self-custody um, option. Otherwise, uh, you know, like just like providing investment um, tools within the existing financial stack. So within my uh, smartphone uh, in my bank account. So just having like a one click opportunity to get into crypto, which is obviously already right. live in for within a couple of banks, um, more like neo banks. And so that's pretty easy to do. Um, maybe also so right now, it seems that a lot of centralized um, uh, companies are trying to, because they are the first one um, in, in the space, uh, bridging crypto and, and, and traditional finance, they are charging a ton of fees, <laughs> which uh, is not really uh, sustainable. And so just like lowering down the fees to make it interesting again, again. Um, is um, definitely important, especially for the on-ramp and off-ramp side of things. And then creating content, uh, making sure that people understand what they're doing. You know, like when you're investing in your traditional, um, uh, in, a, in a traditional investment portfolio in a bank, you've got like notes and, and lots of things to, to learn about um, what the, the bank is going to do with the, with your money and so on. So kind of the same thing, but for crypto. So banks need like in-house capabilities or partner with people that are pretty knowledgeable in the space to guide their customers. I think another interesting angle is the ability for banks to help people manage their personal risk when it comes to this investment, right? Because obviously they've got a good overview of what people are spending money on and how their what their portfolios are like. And they can actually provide people with better information on how to spread their risk and allocate risk. Yep. Um, especially like what uh, Pulse Index is doing, they have a basket full of DeFi uh, uh, potential um, portfolio, portfolio items. items. Uh, for those who are not really deep into DeFi and the crypto space, it would be good if they would like invest in particular indices that matches their risk appetite. Right. Especially as you guys mentioned, in order to learn a lot of these tokens, you really have to put in a lot of time. Yeah, definitely. One thing that we're working on at DeFi Pulse, which I think is going to be pretty interesting for, for banks and, and, and traditional finance actors, is a new set of indices that will uh, aggregate all the, the, the stablecoin yield opportunities in the space into a single index. OK, and so the idea being that instead of having to delve into thousands of protocols and trying to find the best risk reward opportunity, you just uh, you can actually just like get access to a single index that is itself uh, made of different risk tranches, OK, with different risk reward profiles. And so you could technically buy the, the higher risk uh, tranche or the lowest one or mm -hmm. just buy the full index. index. And, and this way, if one of the protocols get hacked, you're just losing a, a, a tiny slice of, of your uh, portfolio, but you're still earning on the 95% remaining uh, assets allocated. So I think it's it's pretty good from a UX point of view. And it, it would be rebalancing on a recurring basis as well. So you keep up with the base, the yield and so on, but you just sit back and relax again. Like, like uh, you would do with your traditional investment portfolio in a bank. Yeah. I think, I think one that... Um, that, that all you have mentioned, but but it's about experience. I think the customer experience should be exactly the same as what they are used to it now. Like, and 
sometimes in DeFi you go <laughs> into some protocols that even for people that have been in the space look pretty sketchy even though they are fine and they they are okay but but the experience is still is not there right and I think it, that some that that traditional institutions can can provide and, and in a way can can do easily just kind of providing or making uh, the the customer a uh, journey seem safe and, and, and easy yeah Cool. Shall we move on to the next piece, which is the benefits to the bank? If we solve, you know, look at looking at the left side that we, you know, identify some of the solution, what will be the benefits to the bank? So adopting crypto investors, the retail investors going into the banks for for invest for, for crypto investment. Well, that's, that's, yeah, I mean, maybe don't get left behind. <laughs> <laughs> so that they won't die. Yeah, or simply you see the investments of their clients move out to uh, to DeFi pro uh, platforms. Yeah, uh, instead of uh, it being uh, a source of competition, now it seems to be eventually to be a source of existence. For survival. Mm -hmm. oh, they will, also, they will be reduce costs. Actually. Sorry, please go ahead. No, no, I was saying that they will be attracting generation that is completely disenfranchised from traditional financial institutions, right? So. One other thing that uh, I think is pretty important is the, the cost saving side of things, um, which obviously, since everything is run by smart contracts, you don't just, I mean, like once it's in the smart contract, you don't, do, not, do not have anything to do anymore. So like the lending side of things is already take, taken care of. Um, the tax, the liquidity provision is already taken care of by the, the smart contracts. So you can actually implement any strategy you wish that people are actually running today, but you could do it in a completely automated and, and, and robust way. Um, you can actually, it's it's such like a, it's a complete playground. You can, it's code, so you can code pretty much anything you want. Okay, so, so any product that you uh, package for your customers, you can actually do it in a DeFi way um, and a complete uh, seamless way uh, and, and, and cost-free way for the bank. No, I'm just thinking there is another challenge on the bank side, which is uh, educating people on the bank side to everything happening in the DeFi space for them to sort of uh, get started with this and see the benefits, offer it to their clients. Mm -hmm. And also, I think, I think with the advent of the challenger bank, bank, right, bank in fintech, fintech the premise there was to reach the unbanked. But with DeFi, this one can even fulfill that mission with greater magnitude, right? To reach the unbanked, people who doesn't have documents for KYC and all of those things. And um, the the other source of, um, how to say this, uh, to guarantee would no longer be based on documents, but based on behavior. Right, willingness you're able to pay, pay, able to offer liquidity, and that's good business. So as long as it's legal. You can also take you can take the philosophy of micro lending, right? Uh, where they you get community lending portfolios and things like that, and then if you start basing them on a crypto asset, it's a lot easier to manage and maintain and, and things like that too. Which is, which is cool. 
Okay. Um, the second question, I'm just con conscious of time. Do we, the one is, uh, how can we, how can banks offer DeFi protocols uh, to their clients? Yeah, um, probably, Chris, we've already covered it as part of one. So. One and two are very similar. Yeah. Hmm. Let's move uh, on to three. What, what was three? Three is how can banks yeah. leverage DeFi yeah. for their corporates and SMEs? So this has a, uh, obviously the target cu customer would be, I mean, I see obviously trade playing a huge portion of this. So if you think of a uh, think of an SME, I guess uh, industry that you think, what's the first one that comes to mind that would uh, benefit the most from uh, DeFi products? Like I think all, all of them, like all types of corporations, uh, to to increase. I mean, to better manage their treasuries. Uh, you know, uh, because like it's an open ledger, so you can. Um, manage money in a completely seamless way. Uh, you yeah. can make sure that you uh, allocate risk uh, money into different risk branches. Uh, it's just like a better way to manage money. Um, so anything that deals with um, any type of transaction action could actually be handled on chain. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, actually, just when make sure we... you access of liquidity, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, so, uh, your point is really interesting, Etienne. So, because um, yeah, when we think of, of DeFi for SMEs, we usually think of the unbanked and providing them with access to liquidity, as you mentioned, Alejandro. But then it's also interesting to look at this from a um, corporate and maybe even large corporate standpoint and how DeFi can help them with managing their treasury. I also liked how uh, Rav mentioned before that there's a, there are new companies that are starting up that eventually that will be completely DeFi, right? I mean, they'll they won't have the traditional kind of banking space. The, their whole entire operation will be, you know, whether it be in the metaverse or whether it be in a traditional place where all of their wallets and treasuries and books and balances are all kept in in small contracts. Right? So. Um, I think it provides also an opportunity for a completely new market <laughs> um, and startups. Oh, they could also issue their own security tokens if they want to. Geographies no. that you think uh, this would be more relevant to? Anywhere where the cost of banking is very high, right? So if you look at, again, South America is a good example. Yeah, South America has one of the highest adoptions in the crypto space around the whole world. And the reason is uh, multiple, like lack of coverage is super expensive to bank in there. Uh, volatility on their own currencies. So with countries that with volatile, could, could you could you see a central bank, for example, adopting um, I guess we're seeing it a lot, right? Where they're they're adopting digital currencies and offsetting them. Who was the first one? Argentina, was it? Salvador has now accepted uh, Bitcoin as legal tender, legal tender, right? 
Yeah. That a lot of CBDCs are starting to pop around and like I'm pretty sure we're going to be hit with the digital drain and things like that. <laughs> They're a bit of a hybrid of all this. As I say, like a DeFi is just that technology behind how you apply it is it's not there for grass. grass right? Yeah. So if you thought about challenges uh, for these corporates, um, what do you think? Regulations. Are the... <laughs> yeah, regulations. Yeah. yeah. Like, a, how, how are they going to, because because if you're saying like, okay, the theory behind is okay, decentralization. So how are they going to be managing or having that control in a decentralized way? How, how are they going to be just, just Putting like like um, balancing mm -hmm. that that act, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit it's a bit tricky, right? As Alejandro mentioned before, reporting also becomes a big problem here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so, so when you're putting out your financial statements and financial records for the year, how do you include these as asset types and, and what's revenue versus not? <laughs> what's even? Uh, I don't know, really know. <laughs> Uh, you know, the one that would be the education. Also... Ah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> education, exactly. <laughs> education. Oh, yeah, banks are, are not doing a, a great job of educating their own customers with something that has been running for 500 years. So, so how are you going to do it with this? I guess depending also in the what kind of DeFi offering. If it's not stable coins, then the problem of volatility still remains. Yeah. Do you think banks should be offering stable coins to their clients, consumers and, and SME corporates? If they can be using the protocols, yeah. If, if if not, that's the that's the goal. So yeah, if they can leverage the high protocols to to put that stable point to work, they should. If they can, yeah. and uh, are allowed to. So. And it also depends on the stable coin, right? There are some stable coins that they're being criticized that it's not really backed completely. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're like um, I don't I, I I didn't count them, but like dozens and dozens, I mean, like maybe thousands, but uh, maybe hundreds of stable coins, but um, a couple of them are well known now and working well, like USDC issued by Circle, Tether, USDT, DAI as well, which is fully decentralized, but backed. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of um, solutions out there. Yeah. What do you reckon about uh, uh, USD, Etienne? Uh, sorry, sorry, I didn't get it. I can't. What, what do you reckon about UST, the one from Luna? Oh, uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, have to, I have to study it a bit more. <laughs> I, I don't want to, to give any, like, uh, I don't hold any. I don't hold any. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of hype and noise behind, right? So, so mm. from there to how stable it is in a way, right? It's hard to know. I mean, like, uh, we, we could look into the code, but they're doing some weird things. So uh, I would say, wait a bit, look and see, wait and see <laughs> for this one. <laughs> okay, so what, what, what could we do to help banks leverage DeFi for their corporates. What kind of offerings do you think that? Um, off, the shelf, off the shelf solutions to save money um, in DeFi protocols. A little bit like uh, for retailers. 
with uh, compliance uh, services, self custody and custody services, reporting services, like you know, just like plug and play. Um, yeah. Yeah, so maybe like a similar user experience as everything we've put for consumers, but additional services to manage their treasury, to do a bit of reporting, to help them with accounting as well as it was one of the challenges. Oh, and maybe also one interesting use case is the uh, lending um, of chain on chain. So leverage your on chain assets. Let's say that a company owns uh, Bitcoin, which is uh, something that is uh, increasing in terms of adoption. Uh, being able to get a loan on chain or uh, off chain, sorry, by leveraging your BTC collateral and the other way around. So owning yeah. some assets off chain and being issued a stable coin backed by these off chain assets. So to, to be able to swap between on chain and, and off chain. Yeah, 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 and that brings us back to the real world assets and getting exactly. them as a digital asset. So if, that if we be, do that, uh, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, sorry go ahead. ahead. No, I was oh, just saying, by, <laughs> by doing that, that actually opens up the opportunity for collaterals, using real world assets as collaterals. Yeah. Also, one, one interesting uh, product that uh, banks could launch would be uh, uh, revolving financing uh, facilities. You know, like just open a line of financing uh, that is available so that the client can draw some money when they want uh, using algorithmic uh, interest uh, models to pay the loans when they, they, they want to do so. And so you can actually do it in a completely digital way. So that's pretty cool. And can they make this more affordable because of fractionalization and in the current currencies in terms of where you can't fractionalize beyond two digits. Does it become more affordable? And they go to non traditional uh, clients? Clients? Yeah, you could technically like take any asset off chain and fractionalize it into smaller pieces uh, to make it investable by the many uh, instead of just like a handful of people. Right. But maybe that's more for retails. Hmm. Yeah, so expand the product portfolio to retail or wealth. Or more retail client base. Client base. Is there any benefit you see uh, in the uh, property finance or in the commercial finance sector specifically? Because that's one of the biggest sectors that banks lend to. So there are already uh, protocols or projects uh, doing uncollateralized loans to corporations. Uh, you, could, you could have a look at Maple Finance, Maple.finance. And so what they're doing is they are just like, it's a bank, okay, but instead of doing loans uh, using like a traditional ledger, they're doing um, Ethereum. And so they're doing the KYC process, the due diligence process, but then the loan is actually uh, operated on chain and the lenders are us, the people. So we actually, the, the buy side and the sell side of the, of the bank um, are actually decentralized, but they're just doing the KYC and the, you know, all the compliance uh, checks on behalf of uh, lenders. Yeah, the guys, there are a couple of projects that are on um, on centrifuge that they are doing similar things on their on the sorry on the commercial space for for real estate. So they are uh, using the the asset as collateral and uh, taking loans out of it in order to just improve and then and then resell. Uh, and there was a really interesting application not long ago from uh, Gensock into Maker for development. It was 
around 500 million or something like that, and they want to just be using DeFi funds in order to fund um, um, to fund um, and mortgages. That, that one, talking about the, the fractionalization as well, like because you can fractionalize investments, but you can fractionalize ownership as well, ownership. and that's happening yeah. right now, and that's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely, that's a very good point. Yeah. So speaking of fractionalizing, um, is there a use for DAO in this particular, like use cases? I'm not sure to follow the, the question. What do you mean by no, that? I, I mean, isn't it uh, the centralized autonomous organizations right now? At least in the NFT space, they're just using it for like right. like coming up with a consensus, okay. consensus and voting and all. So I was just wondering if somehow that particular DAO uh, uh, principle is something that can be leveraged to solve some of these problems. In terms of offering insurance, in terms of uh, um, I don't know. That's why I, I'm just I'm just thinking out loud here. I just don't know where DAO would fit in, but eventually DAO seems to be something in the future. So you are seeing something uh, uh, with the art. Let's say, for example, there's different there's um, DAOs being put together to buy pieces of artwork. Uh, how that works in practice over the long term is a different scenario, right? Um, yeah. So if you're looking at a big commercial property and you've got a lead constructor, who, construction company who's doing there, how much they want to be influenced by a DAO, it's a different, it's a different story, right? Practically, it's practically it can get quite complicated with the DAOs, right? Yeah, yeah. So probably not really uh, useful. Um, as a form of solution here, and here. probably if you're going to decide, like, for instance, where to put your eggs or invest on, then probably that can be a DAO, but not for this particular use case. Yeah, so there are like a few experiments that didn't really took, I mean, they took off a lot and they are kind of slowing down these days, um, that which goals were to uh, manage money in a, in a common way, in a shared way. So, uh, the, the idea was to put money to work together instead of, instead of doing it like uh, on your own. A little bit mm -hmm. like an index, but uh, community managed. So uh, let's say that we all together put some money into a smart contract and then we collectively decide whether we would like to invest this money into protocol A, protocol B or C. And this way uh, you could like technically be a free rider in a sense that you could leverage other people's knowledge. Uh, to invest in the right protocol, you can save in gas because every time you pay in transaction on Ethereum, uh, well, it costs you some money, especially in, on, on mainnet. And so, uh, by putting money in a in a single pot, you you can you can actually save a lot. But that's, I mean, yeah, that's a, something might be answering mm -hmm. your question. I'm, I'm not sure about that, but, yeah. but there are, there are risks. I don't know if you heard recently there was one uh, DAO that it was set up for educating students on crypto. That lost a lot of their their funds because they made some wrong decisions in dealing with their treasury management. So the the risks are always there, right? Yeah, yeah, it's true. But I think again, these these pools or these respective DAOs could have leverage as well, right? So if if they're controlling a, a substantial amount, then they almost kind of become a a lead the investor. Yeah. yeah. This is something, this is a trend that has been taking off for the past couple of months. Uh, the idea of uh, being a powerhouse in the DeFi space, because a lot of protocols uh, have their own ERC20 token, so they are governance token. And so owning a lot of these governance token allow you to uh, uh, kind of uh, um, decide uh, on the strategy of the protocol. And you know, yeah. like um, um, whitelist a couple of assets that you like or not. And so, if you own my own, maybe something like twenty five percent of the tokens, uh, you're pretty much free to do whatever you want. Uh, it's kind of your own protocol in a sense. And so, by putting your money in the in a single DAO, 
uh, you can become really powerful in a in a specific protocol and and, and help yourself in that. Yeah. Even though it's kind of going against decentralization. In those, but, uh, <laughs> At some point, it needs to require because is what is the the right level of decentralization in, in in these organizations, right? And and like at some point, you need to just have some components that should be in a way centralized to just have or, or to expedite some processes, right? And and from that point, you can just take it into the community. We were seeing it like like the experience our experience with with DAO sometimes is like they ended up more political and more bureaucratic in a way than, than traditional institutions. So uh, what is what is the right uh, amount of or level of decentralization? I, I think that's what DAOs are, are still exploring, right? Like uh, this concept is fairly new and, and and I assume it will take decades until it gets perfected, right? Yeah. Right, do we want to move to identify the, the benefits to the bank? I think we didn't talk about something, but uh, the, the increase of revenues for banks is both true for retails and, and, and SMEs, because um, even though the if, if the banks are using existing DeFi protocols, like Compound or Wire or whatever you name it, um, some of them, so they, they are just a front-end to the infrastructure, okay? They are not actually implementing the strategy or the, 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 the actual investment process. They're just like a place where people can click on to get into the DeFi uh, ecosystem. And so they are not really managing the funds anymore. So they don't, they don't have a leverage anymore in a sense, but all these protocols, they tend to offer profit sharing programs. And so what you can do is close a deal with a DAO or a DeFi protocol and get a cut of the revenues they're making uh, when people actually put money to work through your front end or um, through your uh, custody uh, account. Yeah, like I, I think that concept is interesting and, and, and that's what I see banks probably get is just as a facilitator more than anything else unless they're building their own decentralized technology, right? But yeah, facilitation over this where I can see they can leverage this. Probably a question in this concept is quite known in Islamic finance, right? Is so is there a good applicability of of this uh, model into Islamic funding or lending? Which is yeah, because I'm not an expert. Uh, I, I'm not an expert. I wouldn't be able to touch on that. There are projects looking at it. I have seen a couple. I uh, can't name them off the top of my head, but there are some projects that have come up uh, looking specifically at this. Because the programmability and the validation that you can build within these controls will, will kind of help them naturally in terms mm -hmm. of profit share. Yeah, and you can keep track of the funds. You know what the bank, I mean, the protocol is doing with your money. So you can technically see if that fits into your specific framework or not. So it's a great improvement. Well, the, one of the greatest challenge of the banks right now, they really can't compete in, in I mean, what DeFi is offering. Like for instance, you you look at interest, uh, a lot are offering like for stable coin, they would offer like 8.8% and the banks could not offer such a, such a savings account interest, right? And even for loans, you, you, far better get a lower interest rate for lending in the DeFi um, than in the bank. So in order for the bank to provide competitive rates, they really would would really like look for opportunities to partner with DeFi. That's one of their challenges. They can compete with the rates. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And one of the benefits is also like being able to offer those high rates investments. Yeah. One 
other general benefit for balancers just to be perceived as well as innovators in the space and not like just old players or traditional players. So more of a perception perspective. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I will increase. I'm looking at the mural board. You do have another one, uh, uh, another challenge listed here. I don't know if we would actually have time to go through that. I don't know what <laughs> you're thinking. We have seven minutes, maybe we could jump into that. Uh, Chris, you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an easy one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, an, it's an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> There are already solutions to bring uh, clients' holistic view of their investment portfolios in the DeFi space. And so the bank could actually leverage these like providers. The two of them are called uh, Zapper.Finance, uh, Dapper.Fi, sorry. And uh, the other one is called DBank. Um, D -Bank. D -Bank. And so the idea is just like it looks at your wallets and uh, brings you like uh, covers all the investments and protocols you're into and just like calculate the, the amount of money you have in DeFi. And so you can just like call their APIs and plug that on top of your uh, banking account uh, application and it's done. Although that wouldn't work with custody solutions because you, you would own the you would hold the funds in a in a in a shared way between customers, you would have to split it again uh, based on your internal ledger ledger you'd have to have two ledger yeah of course So just uh, for the last four minutes before we sign off here, I just wanted to open it up to anybody else on the, on the line, anybody that's been quiet or anything like that, or if there's any kind of final questions that you have for your uh, factor or DeFi Pulse. Or Shireen, in terms of the hackathon and what's next. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'll be posting on the chat um, the list of upcoming events. There are uh, lots of other events that we are running, uh, focusing on DeFi. Um, so for anyone interested in joining these as well. But yeah, any any final questions for Dan, Alejandro, Birov? Hey guys, uh, me again. I was uh, ask, wanted to ask about the uh, spring pad. Uh, noticed you guys had um, posted, I think, on the Twitter account that you guys had 150 applicants for the second round. Um, how does that compare with the first round? And what kind of things did you learn from the uh, the initial round after uh, the three um, candidates that were ultimately selected? Selected. Yeah, so the you know, volumes has increased dramatically compared to the first one. Um, for this round, we are trying to select um, 
companies that are taking alternative approach to finance and that uh, regularly they wouldn't be covered with traditional with traditional system that's that's kind of want to do and um for the first uh, uh cohort i think the, the most interesting uh, deal that we're pushing there is uh, a whiskey distillery and the idea is to digitize the whiskey cask and provide liquidity using those those nfts right that have all the information embedded of the whiskey cask and so on in order to make those assets li liquid like a whiskey at the moment is extremely secure asset like a, for example Irish whiskey has been growing 300 percent year and year and price is increasing dramatically so we believe that there is a huge opportunity in there um, and thinking that we can expand that product to a lot of the, um, similar businesses like wine and and uh, and luxury goods right? Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. No worries. Thanks. I uh, also just wanted to mention that we actually have another ideation session with Alejandro and Vera focusing on um, the use of DeFi in the trade finance space. So this uh, one is planned on the 24th of March and you're all welcome to join. I'll just put the link on, on the chat. Um, we do have also another session later on, on the 31st of March, that is uh, focused on uh, data and privacy. Um, we, we speak a lot about having the users own um, or people own their, their data, and uh, we will be exploring during this session how DeFi can possibly help there. Um, and what's interesting is that we will also have uh, some of the experts from Scotia Bank join us on that uh, on that session. I'll also put the link on the chat. Um, and yeah, if we don't have any any other questions, I think it's this was a really amazing session. Thank you so much, um, Alejandro, Vera, Etienne. Uh, we very much appreciate you spending the time and helping all the participants um, explore the space, find some interesting ideas, explore the benefits for different players, consumers, SMEs, the bank. Um, we're really looking forward now to see uh, what everyone would go and build uh, as part of the hackathon and what the submissions will be. So uh, we'll definitely, um, yeah, we'll be sharing with you all of these submissions as we uh, as we reach the end of the hackathon. For everyone on the call, I see uh, many people have actually dropped uh, already, um, but we do have lots of resources on on the hackathon website. So fintech.devpost.com. You can actually access from there once you register the um, discord uh, you would have the list of mentors that are available uh, all the events different resources apis lots of tools to help you get started so um, i'll put the link again there but that's um, <laughs> the main point where you'd be able to find all types of resources to help you with your submission uh, please feel free to reach out anytime to get support from the organizers from the mentors we're here to help you really transform those post-its and ideas into into prototypes and uh, more tangible solutions um yeah to help everyone on the DeFi space so thank you all for your time thank you so much will and chris for facilitating the session and thanks again Etienne, alejandro and vera for your time and um insights that was really helpful thank you so much Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye -bye. Cheers. Thanks, Thanks, nice day. Thank, you. Thank you, everyone, for joining.